Let's face it, Frosthaven sometimes likes to kick you when you're down. Whether it's a pack of hounds pounding you into oblivion, snow wimps perma brittling you, or an Algox priest disarming you at the worst possible time, the foes of Frosthaven can send you into full tilt. Well, if you're tired of being pushed around and want to rain fiery death on your enemies, the Meteor, also known as the Pyroclast, can get you where you want to go. The Pyroclast is like a walking volcano, dishing out destruction by blasting the battlefield with rocks and lava. You get to create, destroy, and manipulate hazardous terrain and obstacles in menacing ways that will make your enemies cry for mercy, and it's an awful lot of fun. Stick around after the break and we'll get to the full size guide for this molten monster. Before we get started on the actual class guide, a few disclaimers. If you didn't guess it already, there are going to be spoilers for this class. If you clicked on a video that was a meteor class guide, and you didn't already realize there are going to be spoilers, sorry that I already spoiled stuff in the intro. But we're going to talk about everything. Everything that comes in this little box, we're going to talk about. So be warned. Let's get this puppy started with the basics. Here's a look at the character card for the Pyroclast. You have a mediocre hand size of 10 with this class, but I found that I lasted plenty long in most scenarios. I didn't feel it was too restricting. You'll also notice that you have middle of the road hit points. You start with 8 at level 1 and by level 9 you have 20 of them. I'll admit that when I first opened this class box I expected something a little bit different. I think it might have been the icon for it which is like this sort of blazing meteor thing. I kind of assumed that it was going to be something like the Spellweaver in Gloomhaven perhaps. Like a ranged, you know, fire based class of some kind. And yeah, the fire definitely plays a part in this, but that's not what it is at all. What I found, however, was a class with incredibly interesting concepts, really fun gameplay, and a whole lot of power. So let's talk about what that is. What is the Pyroclast? The Pyroclast is built around your ability to manipulate, create, and destroy both hazardous terrain and obstacles within the game world. Yes, there have been other classes that have abilities around that previously like the Cragheart and Gloomhaven, for instance. But they only had a smattering of abilities, and they were built around other things, and it just had that as an additional bonus, right? The Pyroclast, on the other hand, is built around the idea of manipulating hazardous terrain and obstacles. All your cards work in concert with those concepts. They enhance your attacks. They sometimes harm your enemies in different and interesting ways. They also give you ways to push and move enemies around through and into obstacles and hazardous terrain. It's a really fun experience. You feel really powerful doing it. And you really feel like you have control of the battlefield with this particular character, which I enjoyed immensely. So how does this actually work? Let's look at a couple examples first. This first card is a core card and you're early going with the Pyroclast. It's Lava Bomb. It's an attack 2 range 3, which isn't exciting on its own, but then you get to the text underneath. When you perform this attack, you also get to create hazardous terrain in the featureless hex underneath the enemy that you targeted. Featureless is a really important concept for the Meteor or Pyroclast class. So what does featureless mean exactly? Basically, any tile that does not have an overlay tile is considered featureless. That means it can have enemies in it, it can have loot tokens in it, but what it can't have is, say, an obstacle. You can't create hazardous terrain when there's already an obstacle there. It also can't have icy terrain, so anything that already has an overlay tile, you cannot create the hazardous terrain in for this card. There are two exceptions to that. One is corridors, which are often, which is basically what a door come, turns into once it's opened, it becomes a corridor. And corridors are often used to, connect, used to connect rooms in a scenario. And the other exception is pressure plates. Those are both also considered featureless, even though they do have overlay tiles. The last thing on this card, it generates fire. There's a move for it. We'll talk more about this card in particular later. All that being said, the other important thing to note here is that even though you created hazardous terrain right on the enemy you just attacked, they do not take hazardous terrain damage. 
Anytime you create hazardous terrain, by default, it does not cause damage to an enemy if it's already in that tile. There are exceptions to this, but the card will explicitly state those exceptions right on the card. It will tell you right on the card, basically, that any hazardous terrain created in this way will cause damage to enemies. It'll do damage one or damage two. It'll tell you exactly what's happening. So you might say to yourself, well, that doesn't sound all that great of a card either. I mean, attack two, range three, you create the hazardous terrain, but it doesn't do anything. So let's look at another card. This card is Melted Armor, another level one card that you'll use quite a bit. It's an attack three, a melee attack at its base. If the target is occupying hazardous terrain, however, you get an additional plus one attack, which makes it a four attack. You also add pierce three and you gain experience. That is a solid level one card. Again, we'll get to the rest of this card later. We'll talk more about elements and all that stuff when you get into each individual card. But for now, that's the overall concept. You have a lot of cards that do that very specific kind of thing with hazardous terrain and also you do things with obstacles. So before we move on, let's look at an obstacle card as well. For the top of cooling, you replace one hex hazardous terrain tile and an unoccupied hex within range four. Unoccupied meaning that there can't be an enemy standing in it already. And you get to replace that hazardous terrain with an obstacle tile. And then when that happens, all enemies that are adjacent to that tile, because think about it this way, it's hazardous terrain. If you think about monster AI and what they do, they're gonna avoid the hazardous terrain at all costs, basically. They will only enter it if they specifically, if it's the only way they can attack one of your party members. So in general, they tend to go around and maybe group around hazardous terrain in some cases. So what you can do here is if you have a few enemies that are surrounding a hazardous terrain tile, you go ahead and replace it with an obstacle tile and that does damage to every adjacent enemy. So that's just another example of how you work with obstacles and hazardous terrain to do damage and do, to, do cool things on the battlefield. Now this is also a good card to talk about one other key concept to the Pyroclast. And that concept in this case is a negative one for the class. The Pyroclast has an awful lot of power. You can do a lot of things with control and manipulation, dish out a lot of damage. But as in all cases, there has to be some sort of balance to it. That's where the concept of mandatory persistent bonuses come in. So look at the bottom of this card now. You have a five heal self, which is pretty nice. But when you perform that five heal self, if you look right underneath it, the text says on your next three move abilities, you have to subtract one from that move ability. This is also a good example of how sometimes there's real thematic elements. This card is cooling. You're basically a walking lava magma dude or whatever. And so for this card to heal, you have to cool off a little bit, which also slows you down. Makes total sense, right? Kind of cool. Anyways, back to the mandatory persistent bonus. So you'll notice that you have to put one of your character trackers on it because it's the next three movements are affected by this. And you might know that from classes like the Drifter that have things like this, you can dismiss those at any time. You can just decide, you know what? I don't want this bonus anymore. I want to get this card back in my discard or whatever. I just want to get rid of it. And you can do that at any time, during, whether it's during your turn or some other time. It also affects things like summons. You can just dismiss summons whenever you want. They're basically like persistent cards that stay out in front of you. But with these type of bonuses on the Pyro class, you cannot dismiss these whenever you want. It's a negative effect that you have to deal with. So for the next three turns, after you use this, you're going to move a little bit slower. Maybe that doesn't matter, maybe it does. There are only two ways to get rid of these mandatory persistent bonuses. One way is to actually go through the three movements, and then the thing falls off your card, and then it goes back in your discard pile. The other way is, you, is if you perform a rest action. Anytime you perform a rest action, short rest or long rest, you get to dismiss any of these mandatory persistent bonuses. So let's jump back to Melted Armor to look at another one that has some unique elements to it. The bottom of this starts with a mandatory persistent bonus, which is not great. All attacks targeting add plus one damage. This is not the card you want to lay down if you're surrounded by enemies and about to be attacked multiple times because every one of those attacks will get plus one attack against you. And if you remember when we talked about the hit points, you don't have a ton of hit points. You have that middle of the road hit point total. It will get better as you rise up in levels, but early on you're pretty squishy overall. So getting plus one to all the attacks targeting you is not a great thing. 
However, on your next three attacks, you get to add plus one. So you get the good and you get the bad and you have to deal with both of them at the same time. If you strategically use this card, use it the proper way and can get off a bunch of attacks kind of right away, you can dismiss this card pretty easily and not have to worry about that negative aspect of it. I just wanted to show this as another example of a negative persistent bonus that you have to deal with. There's many more that are part of the class and we'll get into that as we look at all the individual cards later. With those core concepts out of the way, let's flip over that character card and take a look at the back. The Pyroclast has a stated difficulty of three. I think this is accurate for this particular class. It's actually not difficult to do a lot of the things with the Meteor. Once you understand the way that things work, it's easy enough to do your attacks and cause decent damage, even if you're not playing it optimally. The real complexity and the real difficulty in this class is if you really understand it and really get the most out of it. I think personally this is a great class for min-maxers. If you want the kind of class you can squeeze the most value out of it you possibly can by playing optimally, the Pyro class might be the class for you. If you don't want to do that, if you'd rather see consistency and just be like, okay, I know what I'm doing every turn, I don't have to think about all the ways that enemies move, I don't have to think about what everyone else is doing, this may not be the class for you. Sure, it's not difficult to play overall, but it's difficult to get the most out of it. And while we're talking about that complexity, I want to talk about what makes it so complex. We did look at the way that you manipulate hazards, terrain, and obstacles, and yes, there are some cl complexities there. But the heart of the complexity for the Meteor is understanding how enemies move. You have to understand how they're going to perform their movements to get the most value out of your obstacle and hazardous terrain placement. I mentioned a little bit earlier, they're going to avoid it. They're going to try not going through hazardous terrain. They're also obviously going to avoid obstacles. So the way that you place these things out, where you put them on the battlefield, can be really critical. You can use them to control where enemies go. And if you look at the little chart there at the bottom that shows where your strength are, you can see that the highest thing that it rates is your control ability as a pyroclast. Because not only do you create that hazardous terrain and those obstacles, and you can route monsters around in different ways, you can get them away from your party members who are in trouble by putting down hazardous terrain and obstacles strategically. You can sort of funnel them to particular areas where you have a killing field set up. There's a lot of things you can do with control just by laying down your obstacles and hazardous terrain. Aside from that, and we'll see this more when we get into more cards later, you also have quite a few cards that allow you to manipulate the location of monsters, meaning pushes, pulls, things of that nature. Which makes total sense, because if you create a few hazardous terrain tiles in certain areas, maybe an enemy walks around it and avoids it. Well, what if you can attack that enemy and then push it right into the hazardous terrain? Not only do you get a lot of free damage, unblockable, unshieldable damage, but it's also a lot of fun. There's nothing better than punching a guy in the face and then pushing him through one or two hazardous terrain tiles, which you can absolutely do with this class. You'll notice that the second highest rating on this little chart is melee. I mentioned earlier, I assume this was going to be more of a ranged attack class, and you do have a few ranged attacks, and you can manipulate hazardous terrain and obstacles at range. But most of your actual attacks are melee based. So you do have to get up in there in close and personal. So yes, you have to get right up in there to hit enemies a lot of times, but you also have those abilities to push and move them around at will, which is fantastic. Last thing to note here are elements. You do generate fire and earth quite a bit, and you use them both quite a bit. If you have other people in your party that generate these elements for you, you might be the one that should get priority in a lot of those things, because they do give you bigger and more important bonuses. I just mentioned that because in a lot of cases, burning elements is really just for, it might just give you a little more XP, or it might just give you a, sm a small added effect to an ability. With something like the Pyroclast, usage of elements can be critical. Okay, now before we get to each individual card, which I know you're waiting for, we're going to get to them all. We're going to talk about them all in this video. I want to talk very briefly about builds with the Pyroclast. The Pyroclast is mostly a high damage class. You can dish out a lot of damage, you can control the battlefield like we talked about. 
but a lot of your capability is built around doing damage, which is always fun. I love doing damage. Who doesn't? There's not a whole lot of variety for builds for that, in my opinion. You can maybe focus more on hazardous terrain or obstacles because there are more, you know, there are cards that do each one differently. But in many cases, they sort of work together back and forth. Like you'll turn hazardous terrain into an obstacle or obstacles into hazardous terrain, things like that. I will say that the way I played the class, I focused much more on hazardous terrain, which I believe is the accepted way to play Meteor that most people who play the class play it. I do want to mention one other aspect or one other build that's actually out there. There is actually a tank build for this class. It's not something you can do at level one, although you do have a persistent uh, shield card that you can put out. Again, we'll get to that in a little bit. But as you level up, there are a few cards that when you put them all together, if you select all those cards, you can be a pretty satisfying tank in, in Frosthaven. I think the cool part of trying to be a pyro class tank is that you're a tank that also does a lot of damage and controls the battlefield. So you kind of have it all. Anyhow, we'll talk about that more when we see the different cards. And you'll clearly see where the tank cards are and how they act and things of that nature. But anyhow, let's move on. Let's get to the cards. I'm going to do this the same way I did in my recent Bone Shaper video, which I'll link up here. I'm going to go through the cards in the order they come out of the pack. I do think that they're in that order for a reason. I don't know if it's because that's the order that they conceived of the cards or how they conceived of the class. Or maybe they just think they're the best examples to teach you how to play the class. In any case, that's the order I'm going to go through them in. So the first card here is one we already talked a little bit about called Cooling. For the top action, you replace a one hex hazardous terrain tile within range four with an obstacle tile. Now it has to be unoccupied, like I mentioned when we talked about that before, meaning there can't be an enemy in it. You can't just create an obstacle tile where there isn't an enemy in most cases. Once you do that, any enemies adjacent, or all enemies adjacent to that obstacle tile, then suffer two damage. And this is where some of that power of the meteor really comes in. First of all, there could be a lot of enemies surrounding this thing since they do avoid hazardous terrain. And secondly, it's just suffer damage, pure two damage. Goes through shields, they can't block it, there's no modifier that you have to draw, you can't miss with it. Just pure damage straight to their hit points, even for things like flame demons, which everyone hates. In addition to this pretty useful top ability, it also generates earth, which again, is something you'll use quite a bit. You'll also notice that there's a theme whenever you do something that creates hazardous terrain or you need to create hazardous terrain, it usually involves fire. Conversely, anything that involves obstacles, it's usually earth. You also get an experience and it's non-loss. Now you may look at the initiative and go 75, you know, that's not great. But I would say that it's a fairly useful initiative where if you want to use that when you're going to use this ability, it might make sense. Going at 75, you can see what the enemies do, where they end up. So you can use the optimal hazardous terrain tile to turn into an obstacle. We also talked about the bottom of this card already. It's a heal five self. You do have a couple heals that are available to you as you level. They're all heals of just you. I don't think that they have any heals that you can heal one of your party members or allies or anything like that. It has that mandatory persistent bonus where after you've performed this heal, your next three movements are at minus one, which is not the worst mandatory persistent bonus out there. Trust me, we'll see other ones which are definitely more impactful. Our next card up is Quenched Rage. Gotta love some of these titles. I've talked about it in some of my other videos. I really love how they tie in the titles. They make sense. They're not just throw away. In this case, it's a push three at core. And this is where I talked about earlier. One of the things that you can do as a pyro class is you can manipulate monsters, monsters position to take advantage of the location of things like obstacles and hazardous terrain. So for this card, let's imagine you have several hazardous terrain tiles out, which you can and often do have up to six hazardous terrain tiles out that you've created. Let's say they're grouped around the enemy or behind the enemy. In this case, you get to push them right through it. And the bonus here is if you have earth to burn. If you have earth to burn, you can use that to basically double the damage of any of those hazardous terrain tiles that that enemy gets moved through for this ability. So let's say you're just doing level three difficulty, then hazardous terrain does two damage. That turns each hazardous terrain you push that enemy through into four damage. Let's say you have it set up correctly and you can push them through three hazardous terrain tiles. 
That's 12 damage. 12 damage, unblockable, unshieldable, 12 damage. You can even take something like an Earth Demon and brutalize it with the ability like with an ability like this. A lot of fun. The other thing you have to note about this is when you do that, those hazardous terrain tiles do go bye-bye. They turn into obstacle tiles and you gain an experience. But if you're going to dish out 8 or 12 damage to somebody, it can definitely be worth it to do this. And the cool thing is once you do put out those obstacle tiles, you can maybe turn them back into hazardous terrain tiles. Or you will have more hazardous terrain tiles available to put out on your next turn. Great top action. And Quenched Rage also has a really interesting mandatory persistent bonus bottom. In this case, when you put this sucker out, your next three attacks will be at minus one, which sucks. You know, that lava bomb that we talked about earlier that we'll talk about again soon, where it's an attack two, it's now an attack one if you have this card out. Not great. But then that fourth attack, that fourth attack, you get to double the value at that point. And I will tell you, we will see it soon. You can get some big, hefty attacks with the Meteor. And if you can double some of those big, hefty attacks, that can be really, really valuable. And again, this is what I talked about, the min-maxing capabilities of this character. If you plan out the way that you're using these attacks for this, like actually Lava Bomb is the perfect example. Lava Bomb isn't really about the damage. It's about getting that hazardous terrain tile out and getting out right underneath that enemy, right? So the difficulty here and that min-maxing is about figuring out what's the best way these next three attacks at minus one cannot be a big deal. How can I best utilize this? Can I do multiple attacks in one turn and sort of get moving towards it? And how do I plan for when to do that final attack and really wail on somebody with it? Fun, fun card. It also generates Earth, by the way. Next up, we have Flowing Fire. I use this card an awful lot in my days with the Pyroclast. I really enjoy it. At its core, it's an attack two, and you can attack up to three enemies with it if you have three enemies all lined up in a row, as it's illustrated on the card here. And that attack two, if you can get three enemies on its own, can be pretty good. But that's not what I usually use this for. The other element to this card is if you have fire available and are able to burn that fire, then you can also use it to generate more hazardous terrain. So basically, the most hazardous terrain you can create with this at its core is two hazardous terrain tiles. You have to have one enemy in one of those red hexes, and then there have to be featureless hexes on either side, the front and back of the enemy, or the two hexes behind the enemy. They have to be featureless, and then you can put hazardous terrain in those tiles. You also do gain an experience. It's important to note here that the card is explicit. Those have to be empty tiles. They can't be occupied by other enemies. They can't be occupied by anything. It has to be completely empty for you to put down that hazardous terrain. But still, again, it's a 20 initiative. It's a non-loss top. It's one that you can definitely set up from one turn to the other. That's a great way to get additional hazardous terrain out on the map, which is important. Now, the bottom of this one is very interesting. It's a move six. A move six. That's hot, right? But it has a nasty mandatory persistent bonus. When you perform that move six, you have to suffer a damage right then. And then at your next two turns, you get to suffer damage at the beginning of them. This is a level one card. If you're level one, you have eight hit points. So if you take the maximum damage from this, three damage from this, that's almost half your hit points just for doing a move six. So remember what I said about resting though. If you time this right, you do your move six, you have to take that one damage. At a minimum, you're taking the one damage for this. But if you then rest your next turn, either long rest or short rest during your next turn, you get to get rid of this and you don't take any more damage. That's pretty good. Here we have our first burn card, Eruption. To start, you create one hex obstacle tile within range five and an empty hex. Like I mentioned before, Obstacles are almost always created in empty hexes. No figures, no overlay tiles. Then, and this gets a little complicated, you create hazardous terrain in all occupied, featureless, adjacent hexes to that new obstacle you just created. Occupied and featureless means there has to be an enemy there, but there can't be an overlay tile there. And one thing to watch out for, it just does say occupied, it doesn't mean occupied by an enemy. If you happen to have one of your party members in one of those adjacent tiles, they also will have hazardous terrain appear underneath them. 
and that hazardous terrain will do 4 damage to every figure in one of those new hazardous terrain tiles. It also generates both fire and earth, and like I said, it's a burn and you get 2 experience for this. A lot of ifs when it comes to this card. Yes, I do think that there are situations where you can easily get 1 or 2 enemies with this, and then you do... If you get 2 enemies with this, that is 8 damage, that's nothing to sneeze at. But for a burn card, I like to get a little bit more value out of it. So hopefully you can find the right situation to use this as a burn card. It's a 47 initiative, totally middle of the road, so who cares? Basically useless as an initiative number. But the bottom is also a bottom attack, a melee attack. Attack 2 and you generate fire with it. Here we get to Lava Bomb, which we've talked about already a little bit. Attack 2, range 3, and you get to create hazardous terrain in the featureless hex occupied by the target. It does also generate fire, so it can be a very good setup card for your next turn. This was often the first card I played in a given scenario, because you usually, at least in Frosthaven in my experience, you can usually get in a position where there's going to be an enemy within range 3 of you, so you can get this out sort of right away to get some hazardous terrain on the map as soon as possible. It's a 53 initiative, which like the previous card, that's a useless initiative, but it's there, whatever. Um, and the bottom is a move 4. Move 4s are always good. Can never go wrong with move 4s. Move this is a card I kept with me all the time. I often use it as my first action, like I said. It's also a card I enhanced just before I retired this class. So I really like this card. I think it's, some, it's one that you'll keep with you basically all the time. Now we have Igneous Path. Igneous, I think, means that it's like rock formed from lava or something like that, which is basically what the Pyro class is. You're a walking lava rock dishing out destruction. Pretty cool. So with Igneous Path, you designate a featureless hex within range 4. By now, we should understand what a featureless hex is. Like I said, it's important to the way your class works. After you designate that hex, you get to create a line of hazardous terrain to it. Basically, an all featureless hex is on the way to it, and that featureless hex that you designated originally. You can't do like some S pattern to get six hazardous terrain tiles out, no, nothing like that. I think you can move it around a little bit, but it has to be a direct path to the target. And here's where I mentioned earlier, it's important to read the whole text. In this case, figures that occupy that, those newly created hazardous terrain tiles suffer three damage. Now it says figures again, so figures means both enemies and your compatriots. So you can hurt your, your buddies too, so be careful with this one and where you put them. And for each figure that is harmed in that way, you get an experience. So it is a burn card. Since there's four, so it's range four, so I think you can create up to four hazardous terrain tiles in a perfect situation. If you manage to get four people in that, then you're dishing out 12 damage and getting four experience. That sounds awfully great. I never accomplish that, and I use this card quite often, but, you know, it is a burn action, so it's the kind of thing where you have exactly the right situation. You're going to get a lot of benefit out of this top action. However, what I would also say about this card is it has our highest initiative so far at 18, so it's a very useful card in that respect. And the bottom is actually very useful too, and it's also interesting and sort of complicated. So the bottom is a move one base, which is not exciting, obviously. But then you get to create hazardous terrain tiles and any featureless hexes that you leave with the action. If you burn fire, you get to move one more, so it turns into a move two, and you get an experience for that movement. Now keep in mind, if you happen to have items that allow you to move further, that's a great time to use them just before you use this. Under pressure. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 You know, you know the song, don't you? You're older. My audience is older. I know. You know the song. Under pressure, it's a base attack 3, but if the enemy is adjacent to two hexes that contain obstacles, objectives, or walls, you get to add two attack and an experience. That's an attack 5 at level 1. It sounds somewhat complicated that they have to be adjacent to two, hex two hexes that contain those things, but honestly, it's not that hard to pull off. Think about any time you enter a new room, enemies are often right up against walls. So if you get next to an enemy that's up against a wall, they're already adjacent to two tiles that contain walls. There's obstacles all over the place, you're also creating obstacles. This happens quite often, and it's a non-loss, attack 5 with an experience, it's pretty solid. The 85 initiative is really only useful if you're trying to go after the monsters for one reason or another, which definitely does happen with this class. All adjacent enemies suffer 1 damage, and then you perform a loot 1, it also generates earth. 
This is great if there's already loot tiles available. It's also great if there are several enemies or two enemies or maybe even just one that's about to die and you can kill with that one damage and then loot their tile immediately as well. Pretty solid card, one you want to bring quite often. Melted Armor, we've seen this one before. It's a base attack three, but if the target is occupying hazardous terrain, it's an attack four with pierce three and an experience. Rock solid card. You also generate fire out of this, which we've already seen some uses for fire. There are more of them coming. It's a 62 initiative, so nothing to write home about. And we've already discussed the mandatory persistent bonus on the bottom of this one as well. When you put out this bottom, all attacks targeting you will gain one damage. And for your next three attacks, you will also get a plus one to your damage. It's bad if you're not smart in how to use it, but it's good if you are smart with how to use it, which is the way it should be, right? If you do this late in a turn, then you go early the next turn, make sure that you do a bottom action where you attack and a top action when you attack or something to that effect. Or maybe you're attacking multiple enemies in some way. You want to do that, you can get this out and get it out from in front of you pretty much right away without taking any damage from it, if you're careful. But again, be careful with cards like this. I like this card a lot. I brought it with me kind of all the time. I already mentioned that I focused on the hazardous terrain. So I always try to get people into hazardous terrain so I could start hammering on them with this card. Next, we have one of our more straightforward tops, Liquid Stone. It's an attack three, and then you get to push two. I'll also add that this was another card that I enhanced just before I retired my Pyroclast. You'll notice that there's a diamond after the three attack. So that means you could add negative conditions, which is what I did. I added, I think it was poison I added to this. So it was an attack three with poison, with poison and then push two. You could also enhance that push to make that push go further, for instance. So a really strong card, a good candidate for enhancement for the Meteor class. The 28 initiative, which is one of our better initiatives. We don't have Banner Spear initiative, we don't have Blink Blade initiative, but we can go higher when we need to for sure with the Pyroclast. And the bottom is a really good monster manipulation card. You get a move three to start. And after you do that move three, you get to push one within range one. So you have to move right up next to an enemy, but then you can push him one. So use that three to maneuver to the, to the position where you're going to be able to push him into hazardous terrain. It's a solid bottom action. If you burn earth, you get to add two to that push. So if you have, if you have a network of hazardous terrain set up and you can use that move three to get into the right, into the right position, push an enemy three spaces, go, go through two, maybe three hazardous terrain in that action. It's a really, really solid bottom. I took this with me for a long time. I think this is a great card to have in your deck. I should also mention if you are able to burn that earth, you do get an experience too. Forgot to mention that. With Cloud of Ash, we went from a pretty simple top with the last card to a really complicated top with this card. So bear with me here. So you're gonna designate a hex within range four. That hex needs to contain an obstacle. As you're aware, obstacles can be one tile or they can be multiple tiles. So even if it's like a three tile obstacle hex, you can still designate one of the hexes that contains that obstacle tile. When you do that, you destroy that obstacle. So you remove the entire obstacle, even if it's two or three hexes, you destroy and remove that obstacle. You get to perform an attack one as if you were occupying the hex that you originally designated that contained that obstacle tile. That attack one targets all adjacent enemies, pushes them one and muddles them. It does also generate earth and it gives you an experience. So it's a complicated but solid top, but it's pretty situational. They have to be next to an obstacle. You have to be within range four of that obstacle. I tried this in my first scenario. I did use it successfully, but my first scenario, my attack modifier deck wasn't that great. So it wasn't that great of an attack. It was kind of cool to remove this obstacle, but it wasn't amazing like I hoped it would be. It is a 23 initiative, which is pretty good. So you'll probably take it with you pretty frequently just because of that. For its bottom action, you have a move three just at its base. And then after that move three, you can, you can replace two one hex hazardous terrain tiles with obstacle tiles if you want to. This is a may, you don't have to, but you're able to. If you do, you generate earth and generate, generate an experience. But hey, it's a move three even before all that stuff. So it's still a solid bottom to have around. Okay, now we're moving into the X cards for the Pyroclast. The first one here is called Wildfire. Top action here, destroy one adjacent hazardous terrain hex. If you do, you get to add wound, 
poison, and generate fire on your next three attacks. You've seen that fire is pretty important for the Pyro class so that you can generate it on three turns like that or three different attacks. Pretty solid, pretty useful. It's a 72 initiative, which again, who cares about a 72 initiative? The bottom is a move four, but when you use that move four, you have to wound yourself. And at the end of that movement, you do also get to wound up to two targets that are next to you. So you move four, get next to two enemies, wound both of them, but you also have to wound yourself. This is great if you have somebody around that can just get pop you with a one heal next turn. Maybe you have the amulet of life or something you can use to get rid of that wound. So it's not the worst uh, mandatory persistent condition. Force of the Earth is an attack one, range three, pull two with muddle. Pretty boring action overall, but with hazardous terrain and the things that you can do with it, this can be a great action. You have an enemy that's a couple spaces away from you, up to three spaces away from you, and you have hazardous terrain in the path, can pull them right through it. Really solid top card. And I've already mentioned that your attack modifier card, attack modifier deck can be pretty strong. So you can make this attack one something better pretty easily and additionally pull them through hazardous terrain. So it's a pretty good top action. It is, is also a very high initiative for you at 15. So this is definitely a card that I took with me early on for sure. Um, just for that 15 initiative and being able to manipulate the monsters, that's a really good one right there. The bottom action, I did not use very much. In fact, I don't know if I've ever used the bottom action on this. For the bottom action, you get to destroy an adjacent obstacle. And if you do, the next two heals targeting you get plus three to those heals. And the second heal, when the card actually exhausts, you will get an experience out of that as well. It seems okay. And I guess if you know you're going to get healing and you're next to an obstacle, you can make this work. But I just wasn't in the right situation to ever use it that way. I mostly used it because I like that top where I could manipulate enemies and pull them right through hazardous terrain. One of my favorite things to do with this class is push and pull enemies through hazardous terrain and do it repeatedly. Push them through hazardous terrain, rinse and repeat. And finally, our last card that we have available to us at level one, our last level X card, and you remember, if we go back to my little build section before we got into the cards, I mentioned that there's some tankiness that you can have available to you as the Pyroclast. Well, here's the one example of that you get at level one. The top is a scenario level persistent ability, shield one, retaliate one, and generate earth. You get two experience for it. It is a burn, but again, when you put it out, it stays out for the entire scenario. It's not like you generate the earth every round or anything like that, but you do get the shield and retaliate from then on. And if you're in a party where you know that you're the person that's going to be up close and personal a lot of the time, this can be a card that's worthwhile to bring and have with you available. I mean, one shield is not fantastic, one retaliate isn't fantastic, but the fact that you just put them out and have them forever for that scenario, that can be pretty solid in the right situation. It's a bad initiative at 68, but again, I feel like I see this in every video, I just start saying who cares to initiatives. It's like the only initiatives I care about are ones that are really high or ones that are really low. Kind of everything in between, I'm like, yeah, it could be good, it could be bad, who cares? So again, this level initiative, who cares? In the bottom here, you get to move the character token along your persistent abilities up one. So because our persistent abilities are negative for the most part, it can be really valuable to be able to move one up. If it's like the damage one, then you move it up without taking the damage. Or if it's one of the, you know, the ones that you minus one to movement, it's another way to get that out of the way. And then you get to a move, get to do a move three as well. So a decent card overall. I honestly, in full disclosure, I never brought this card, but I was also never interested in trying to be a tank. I didn't need to be. Someone else was taking that role in our party. Before we move on, here's a look at my level one build. This is what I used. You can use what you like. You're really only making three card choices. You can adjust a few of these if you, maybe you like that shield card that you can have at level one, go ahead, take that. You really can't go wrong. Just take the cards you like. I would recommend to make sure that you take enough cards that generate hazards train. So you want like Igneous Path, you want Lava Bomb, you want Flowing Fire, you want those available to you at level one. And you also wanna make sure that you have some of these manipulation things so that you can move enemies in and out of hazardous terrain. But the things around the edges, you know, your 8th, ninth, and 10th cards in your hand, pick what you like. Before we move on to card choices, I want to make a little bit of a disclaimer about this process. 
First thing I want to say is I'm just one opinion out here. There are other opinions that might have different thoughts about which cards are good and which cards are bad. I also don't think any of the cards are bad in Frosthaven. The class balance is really good. Um, there's a lot of variety there. There's a lot of interesting things, different types of abilities, different things like that. And while some classes have more defined builds, I really don't feel like the Meteor or the Pyroclast has a really strong defined this build path versus this build path. I did mention earlier that you can build this class tanky if you want. There are some interesting tank cards, but for the most part, I'd say most of your cards are going to do a lot of damage. Whatever way you go with the Meteor, you're going to do a lot of damage and probably have fun with it. And fun, I think, is the most important part. Whatever my stupid little opinion is, do what card seems fun to you. Whether it seems fun to you from a role-playing perspective, or it seems fun to you from a perspective of, wow, I can do a ton of damage with this card. Whatever that is for you, make the choice that's best for you. Anyhow, let's get to it. Here's a look at the cards available to you at level 2 with the Pyroclast. First on the left, we have Searing Smoke. It's a base attack 2, target all adjacent enemies. If you can burn fire, you add plus 1 damage to it to make it an attack 3 and add an experience. If you have Earth available, you can burn that too. You also add Muddle to that attack and gain another experience. So altogether, if you have both elements and burn them, you get to attack all adjacent enemies for an attack 3 with Muddle. Non-loss. Really solid top action. Really like that. It's a 45 initiative, so who cares, right? The bottom is a move forward jump, and that alone makes it a great bottom. Move forward jump. You also get to muddle any enemies that you move through with that move forward jump, which is just like an added bonus on the top. On the other side, on the right, we have Deep Fury, which is an attack 3 at base. But if you are standing in hazardous terrain, you get to add 1 damage to make it an attack 4, add push 2, and gain an experience. Also, if you are occupying Hazardous Terrain, you get to heal yourself for 2 after you make that attack. So if you're in Hazardous Terrain, you're doing an attack 4, push 2, experience, and heal yourself for 2. That's a lot to happen on one ability action. It's a 38 initiative, which is slightly better than who cares. But the bottom action here, the bottom action is one of these areas where I talked about your ability to min-max. This is one card you could theoretically use to try to min-max your abilities with the Pyroclast. First, you heal yourself for 3. At that point, you put this card out in front of you. Then on your next attack, targeting an enemy occupying hazardous terrain, you get to double the value of that attack. Really, really solid. And again, like I said, this is the kind of card that with some planning could be really beneficial with that bottom action. So which do I recommend? I think you really have two distinct paths here. I think Searing Smoke is probably the better overall card. You're going to get more use out of it more often. There are less restrictions on how the card works. A move four jump is always useful. You can use it all the time. And you're often adjacent to enemies, so you can use that attack too, even at its base. And you often have fire and or earth available to you, which makes it a really solid top attack. On the other hand, with Deep Fury, you get a potentially big damage attack that has some other added effects. With that push two on the top, imagine if you are set up where there are additional hazardous terrain spots that you could push that enemy into. So that could turn an attack four into maybe a total of eight damage in a round with a non-loss card that can be really solid that can be really helpful to your party and that's not even mentioning the heal or the bottom action which can further allow you to sort of boost up your damage overall i took deep fury the first time i played this i think if i had to do it again i might take searing smoke just because i like that move four jump it's more useful more often and although I like the idea of min-maxing, I'm not necessarily a min-maxer, but I think you could go either way and not, not make a wrong choice here. For level 3, our first choice here is Living Magma, which, if you're a graybeard like me, makes you think of Austin Powers. With this card now and the start of your next two turns, you get to do this three times with this card. You get to do an attack 1, targeting an enemy adjacent to hazardous terrain, with pierce 2, wound, and you generate fire. Yes, it's only an attack one, but we're going to talk more about that attack modifier deck later, and I've already mentioned it's a pretty strong attack modifier deck. And then when you're done with this card, you get an experience out of it too. It's also a 22 initiative, which is one of our better initiatives that we've had thus far. So a strong top action for this card. And the bottom here is a way that you can actually relocate your hazardous terrain tiles. So you perform a move, a move one. And then you can move one adjacent hazardous terrain tile up to two hexes away. And we do have to read the text here because it indicates that you can move it into where an enemy is. 
You can take that hazardous terrain, move it two hexes right on top of an enemy. And in this case, that enemy does suffer hazardous terrain damage when that happens. Bonus! On the right, we have Hardened Spike. This is your first really big damage attack. It's an attack 5 at base. And if the enemy is occupying hazardous terrain, you would add an additional damage to that for a 6 attack with an experience if that enemy is in hazardous terrain. Let's go back to our level 2 card. Think about that bottom action where you double the value of the next attack targeting an enemy in hazardous terrain. Well, here you go. How about doing attack 6 with an experience and turn that into an attack 12? It does also generate earth, but on the negative side, you're going to suffer up to 3 damage from playing this card. But hey, if you set it all up, and you got off an attack 12, plus whatever you pull from your modifying deck. That's worth 3 damage, isn't it? Or just the 1 damage if you're going to short rest or long rest right after that. You just wallop the guy. That's pretty strong. That's fun. And that's why even though Searing Smoke at level 2 might be a little bit better, if you really want to go for the juice, you go for the other card in that situation. And here you go for Hardened hard Spike to go with it for a huge attack. It has an 80 initiative, which blah but it also has a move three on the bottom. So it's nice to have a move three here. You also, if you move three and move by an enemy who's next to an obstacle, get to add one to the next attack targeting that enemy. And just to add more fuel to the fire, if you have earth available and burn the earth, it makes it a plus three on that enemy. A plus three to your next attack for burning earth. Really strong. As for which to go with, I went with hardened spike right away. I didn't even really think about it. I got sucked in by the five damage, but I think I got sucked in, in a good way. If you can pull off 6 damage or 12 damage with this card, you can, I mean, you can't ask for more in a level 3 card, can you? It's not a loss either. It's not a burn. So you get to keep it around and use it quite often. It is complicated because the enemy has to be in hazardous terrain, which isn't always going to be the case. Whereas with some cards, you get more damage if you're in hazardous terrain, which you can control. You can't necessarily control this one, but if you have some way to just place them into hazardous terrain just before it someone else can do it who knows you can get a lot out of this card i definitely like hardened spike on to level four first on our left we have hand of flame this is an attack four with muddle it's a melee attack and you also get to create hazardous terrain in the featureless hex occupied by the target this is much like lava bomb from our level one hand but in this case it's a melee attack instead of a ranged attack you do generate the hazardous terrain right under that enemy do remember they do not suffer damage in this case because it doesn't tell you that happens. You also generate fire on this and generate an experience. Pretty strong all around. It's nice to have just a straight attack 4. You have a lot of high attacks with this class but some of them are dependent on location of you or the enemy. In this case it's just a straight attack 4 melee attack which is a pretty solid choice. The initiative is a 29 which is okay. The bottom is an attack 2 with wound. And it's always nice when you're a damage dealer to have a bottom attack available to you. This is not your first bottom attack that's available to you, but an attack two with wound is strong, especially with that attack modifier deck you're going to see later, trust me. On the right, we have Heat Wave. In my opinion, this is one of the first tank cards that you have to choose as you level up. I suppose you could call Searing Smoke kind of tankyish since you're targeting all adjacent enemies. With an attack with heat wave all adjacent enemies just suffer two damage straight up that's always nice especially if you're dealing with things like flame demons or other shielded enemies it's nice to just dish out two unblockable damage like that additionally you get to push two targeting all within range three one thing to remember about something like a push you can even push one of your allies if that's necessary or helpful if an ally is in a bad position where they're about to get attacked and they're within range 3, you could use this to push them around a little bit to get them out of danger, potentially. If you have fire available and burn that, you add 1 to the range, so then you're pushing all within range 4, 2. That's a lot of enemies, potentially, that you're moving around, and hopefully moving into hazardous terrain, or moving out of, moving out of the way so that they're not a danger to your allies. However, it does have a negative effect here. At the start of your next turn, you would suffer 2 damage. But again, if you time your rests, if you do a short rest or a long rest, the round after you do this, play this card, you can get rid of it and not suffer that two damage. Keep that in mind. I also say it's a tank card because of this initiative. It's an initiative eight. Holy cow. Initiative eight is really useful, especially if you are going to try to play it tanky, where you want to attract the attention by having a higher initiative than your party mates. 
I'll say that usually when I'm playing the damage build, I care a little less about initiative with this class. But if I were want, going to be tanky, I would like to have this eight initiative. The bottom here is a move two. And if you have fire available, you can burn that fire to create an obstacle and adjacent empty hex. I think the answer here on which card to choose is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. If you want to do a lot of damage, take Hand of Flame. It's really helpful. If you want to be tanky and go early and manipulate a lot of enemies and do that sort of stuff, then take the other card. And Heat Wave seems like a no-brainer if you want to try that tank pyroclast build. We start level 4 on the left with Rain of Fire. You get to create two 1 hex hazardous terrain tiles within range 3 and featureless hexes. And all allies and enemies adjacent to or occupying those hexes suffer one damage. Keep in mind it says all allies and enemies. So be careful when you're placing these two hazardous terrain tiles from this action. You also gain an experience from this card. The initiative is 21, which is finally one of those that's like, hey, that's a good initiative. That's useful. The bottom, however, is a move five with jump. Do you need to know anything else? Move five with jump. That's hard to pass up. On the right, we have magma orbs. You get to do an attack three, target two within range three. If you can burn fire and earth, burn both elements, you get to add one more target. So it's an attack three, target three, range three. If you play Gloomhaven, if you play the Spellweaver, you'll know that this is like a slightly different version of fire orbs, only this time it's magma orbs. Attack three, target three, range three, pretty strong, and it's not a loss in this case. Whereas for that Spellweaver, that was a loss card. Although we, need, we don't need to talk about loss cards when we're talking about the Spellweaver, right? The initiative here is 82, whatever. The bottom, you get to create one hex hazardous terrain and an adjacent hex, and then you get to perform a pull one range two. So you can create hazardous terrain right in front of you, and theoretically pull an enemy right into it right after. That's pretty strong, that's fun. I think the choice here is honestly easy. I think you have to go with Rain of Fire. I can't pass up a move five jump, especially with the way that I played this particular class. And in fact, like, Though I like magma orbs because I liked fire orbs back in Gloomhaven with the Spellweaver, like, I don't know how it really fits into the rest of your kit as well. Whereas that five jump can be useful no matter what you're doing. So I definitely go with the other card here, and it also has a good initiative. Our first option card at level six is Return to the Source. It's an attack three, range four, pull three. If you have hazardous terrain set up between you and this enemy, this could be a great attack. Attack three, let's say there's just two hazardous terrain tiles you get to pull them through. That's an additional four damage at most levels, maybe six damage, depending on how high the difficulty is set for you. There is a line separator here, so that means that top part, the attack and the pull and all potential hazardous terrain damage happens before you put out the persistent top part of this ability. And what the negative persistent top part says is that the next time an enemy would suffer hazardous terrain damage, it negates the damage. So it doesn't affect the initial attack, but then maybe next round or some other time, whenever an enemy would suffer hazardous terrain damage, they do not. It does also generate a fire, which is always, always useful for us. And hey, look at that initiative, 14, another good one. We're starting to get some more with initiative. And this also has an interesting bottom. It's a move four. You get to ignore the effects of hazardous terrain that you move through during this action. And for every different tile of hazardous terrain you move through, you get to heal one. Well, I guess move through is the wrong thing to say for each hazardous terrain tile you enter because you could heal up to four with this. If you move through hazardous terrain, hazardous terrain, hazardous terrain, and end in hazardous terrain, you just healed for four and you also ignored all the damage that you might normally take from that. Now there's a perk for this class which makes the bottom of this card not as cool, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. On the right side with the Obsidian Shield, it has shield in the title. What build do you think this might be for? And the next four sources of damage you suffer from an enemy attacking you, you get to gain one shield. That's kind of cool. You know, one shield, it's not fantastic, but it's automatic. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to plan for it. You just automatically gain a shield on the next four sources of damage from an enemy attacking you. But the cool part is after that fourth attack hits. At that point, after that fourth attack, that attacker also suffers five damage. Yeah, that's right, suffers five damage. Five damage through shields, five damage, unblockable, five damage, just for the, just for attacking you. And it goes with the class. I mean, you're a walking volcano, like I said, right? You're this living magma thing walking around the battlefield dealing damage. So 
It makes sense that eventually you get some sort of explosive retaliate on somebody. And you get that here. And as an added bonus, when you dish out that 5 damage at the very end, you also get to create an obstacle and an adjacent empty hex. This is a non-loss, so that means you can play it, get those 4 attacks, get that 5 damage out, and then play it again. So you can repeatedly put this card out. It's also a 19 initiative, but... And it's not just the top that is tanky here. Look at that bottom. It's a move 3, but then you have a mandatory negative effect where you either have to suffer 2 damage or destroy an adjacent obstacle. So you can move 3 next to an obstacle. You can just destroy that obstacle to not suffer that 2 damage. But then, after that, you get to negate the next source of damage you suffer this round. So hey, if you want to run right up next to an Earth Golem and let him wallop you for his like base 5 attack or whatever it is, go for it. You're going to be able to get rid of all that damage. It also generates Earth, as these obstacle type, type abilities often do, and it's again a non-loss. I think it's easy for you to figure out which card you go with, it depends on which way you're going. If you're going for damage, you go with Return to the Source. If you're going to try that tanky build, you go with Obsidian Shield. Our first choice here at level 7 is Erupting Rage. Love the name of that one. It's an attack 4 melee attack with a push 2 component and then a whole lot of text underneath that. Basically, when you're pushing enemies with this, if you push them into, you could push them into a hex that contains an obstacle, destroy that obstacle, turn that obstacle into hazardous terrain, and that enemy also then suffers hazardous terrain damage. So if you have an enemy right next to two obstacles, you can push them into each one, turn each one of those into hazardous terrain, and they suffer hazardous terrain from two different tiles. Rock solid. I mean, it's level seven. It should be rock solid, right? It's an initiative 70, whatever. And the bottom here is also useful. You get to create hazardous terrain tile and an adjacent empty hex. Move three and then do the same thing over again. Create another hazardous terrain tile and an adjacent empty hex. It's always important to note the type of hex that you can create these things in with this class. In this case, in both of these cases, it's an empty hex, not a featureless hex. So there can't be figures in it. Now on the right side here, we have Swelter. Swelter has a complicated, interesting top and a really interesting bottom. So for the top, you pick a hazardous terrain tile that's in range four of you. You destroy that hazardous terrain tile and that, then that allows you to perform this next attack. This attack is an attack three where you target all enemies that were adjacent to that hazardous terrain tile. On the card, it says range five, pierce two. It's easy to get confused by the range five here. It doesn't mean range five from the hazardous terrain tile that you just destroyed. It means range five from you, which is essentially exactly the same thing as saying attack all adjacent enemies to that hazardous terrain tile they have to be within line of sight i think is the reason that they did it that way and then they have that pierce two on that attack as well it generates both fire and an experience and again it's not a loss it's a 32 okay initiative but the bottom is a loss and it's a really interesting one could be very very powerful in this case all enemies in the same room as you all enemies it doesn't matter how far away they are all enemies in the same room as you suffer damage equal to the number of hazardous terrain tiles in that room it maxes out at five so even if you got all six of your hazardous terrain tiles in one room that doesn't mean you get to do six damage to every enemy but who's complaining <laughs> you're damaging all enemies for five unblockable unshieldable five damage to all enemies if you have five hazardous terrain tiles in that room this can be great towards the end of a scenario because it is a loss but you can deal a lot of damage really quickly imagine you open up a room and there's a bunch of flame demons in there and there's some hazardous terrain in there already because it doesn't specify on the card that it has to be your hazardous terrain it's just the number of hazardous terrain tiles and then you get to just lay in like a damage three or damage four all of them all at once that's fun, especially get against those pesky flame demons. So a really strong bottom action here, but it is a loss. It has to be a loss for something this powerful. I don't think there's a definite this card is better than the other card at this level. I think they're both pretty good. Both very situational, though. Um, the top of both cards require there to be certain terrain and certain conditions that's really going to propel the card to be more useful than it, than it is at its base. Um, I would say Erupting Rage has a more useful and beneficial, more often bottom action. Whereas obviously the bottom action on Swelter is really powerful, but you're only going to use it once as a loss action. I think I would probably go with Erupting Rage in this case, just because I like that it has at least a pure 4 damage attack. 
Um, and if I don't get those obstacles in the right place, then that's okay with me. And I like the bottom half of it more. I'd go with that one, but not strongly. You could go either way. Level eight, we start with Feed the Beast. Another title I really love, especially given the kind of damage that you can do with this card. Adopt action, that's an awful lot of text on a card, right? So basically what you do here is you you have to have a hazardous terrain tile within range three. You designate that hazardous terrain tile, and then you also have to have an obstacle that's next to you. Next to you, your character, not next to that tile. If you do have an obstacle next to you, you destroy that obstacle, and that allows you to create two hazardous terrain tiles and adjacent featureless hexes to that original hazardous terrain tile that you designated. I know, you need like an abacus or a calculator to figure this one out. There's a lot going on. But man, the payoff can be really worth it. Because then any figure occupying that original hazardous terrain tile that you designated or the two that you just created suffer five damage. I mean, what are some of the most bothersome enemies in Frosthaven? I'll tell you, they're the ones with high shield values. And this is something that gets cuts right through those guys and can take them down. Again, our famous flame demon examples. We can just mow those guys down with an attack like this. It's not a loss. You gain an experience. And it has a decent initiative at 27. It is a case, however, that it's pretty situational. You have to have a few things in place. An obstacle next to you. You have to have um, a hazardous terrain within range 3. You want to have enemies near that hazard or adjacent to that hazardous terrain that are in featureless hexes. There's... I mean, there's a lot of stuff to figure out to make this work, but when you do make it work, it's a lot of potential damage. I mean, in the perfect situation, you're talking about 15 damage. 15 damage for a non-loss action. Talk about hot. The bottom action is a move two with some interesting extra elements. You do that move two, and then if you move next to a hazardous terrain tile, you can destroy that hazardous terrain tile. And then that makes it so the next enemy that you attack also suffers hazardous terrain damage. So you get to do whatever attack that you're doing. Maybe it's one of your attack fours or something else. And then you get to lay hazardous terrain damage on top of it as well. Really solid card, top and bottom. And the other card, Cinder Lance. Cinder Lance is still a solid card. And it's less situational than Feed the Beast, for sure. But let's talk about what it is. It's an attack four, a melee attack as before. If you burn fire, you add another two damage to it, but you also suffer two damage and you gain an experience. If you can also burn earth, you add another two damage to it and also suffer one more damage and gain another experience. So altogether, if you can burn fire and earth, what you're doing is an attack eight. You're suffering three damage and gaining two experience. At base attack eight, it's not a loss. And you got two experience out of it too, but you did have to suffer three damage for that. Cinder Lance is a 90 initiative. Um, I don't say who cares this one because at least at a 90 initiative, you could potentially use that to make sure that you have positioning right for whatever you're doing that round. Make sure the enemies go before you in most cases so that you know exactly where to do the most damage as the pyroclast. The bottom is interesting on this too. It's also not a lost bottom either. It's a move two. After that move two, you get to do an attack three in this formation where you get to attack two enemies. So if you have two enemies that are back to back and you can get right in front of them with that move two, you get to attack each of them for an attack three. Really strong. So honestly, both these cards are very strong. I would take Feed the Beast. I can see there being a point for taking Cinderlance. I don't think either card is wrong in this case. That's one of the things that I really like about the Pyroclast is there aren't any level up cards where I go, oh, you absolutely take this one. Don't even consider the other one. A lot of times it's a hard choice, which is the way it should be. That Cinder Lance is obviously easier to dish out that 8 damage with it, but you do have to take the damage as part of it, which is okay once or twice, but it's not something you want to do repeatedly. By the time you get this card, you are level 8, so you have 18 hit points at that point. Base, if you don't have anything else that increases your hit points and as far as items or whatnot. But still, honestly, I like Feed the Beast a lot more. That just seems like more fun. That's the kind of thing I want to do. And I'm often interacting with Hazard's Train with the way that I like to play this class. And finally, we get to our level 9 cards. Our first option here is Stone Armor. Look at that title. Hint, hint. This is a tank card. It absolutely is. For the top action, it's a scenario effect that you put out. So when you put it out, you get to generate Earth and you get two experience. And then throughout the scenario, whenever you would suffer damage from an enemy, if you are adjacent to an obstacle, you can destroy the obstacle to totally negate the damage. 
And one of the things about building tanky, if you are building the tanky version, you probably are bringing a lot of the cards that create obstacles. So you're really going to want to focus on those things if this is the build that you're going for, because it really comes into play in a great way at the very end here with your level 9 card. If any time you're going to suffer big damage, you can destroy an obstacle to negate it. That can be really strong. And don't forget, you don't it doesn't require you to just create all the obstacles. I mean, there's obstacles all the time in different rooms. And in a lot of cases, there can be a ton of obstacles in some of the scenarios in, in Frosthaven. So this card can definitely be useful. It's also a nine initiative, but since it's all about that persistent top, and you're doing that if you're the tank, and you're probably putting out maybe the first turn of each scenario, the nine initiative really isn't going to benefit you, benefit you very much. Yeah, maybe you can hold on to it for a while. I guess that's possible. But for me, it's probably the kind of thing that I would set up initially because I wouldn't want to use that top action to just do nothing. Um, that's the, the preferred method for, you know, the very first turn of each scenario. But if you hang on to it, the bottom is pretty decent too. To move three with chump, and then you get a shield value of X, which is equal to the number of adjacent objectives or obstacles. That sounds nice, but how many obstacles and objectives are there out there? That's the kind of kind of the question. I mean, there are situations where I definitely see you get like a pretty easy shield two or shield three out of this, but probably not much more than that. Um, and again, we're probably not using this bottom if we're taking this card anyways, right? On the right side, we have our damage build card, Calamity. A really great title for this one. Again, especially for a level nine card. That's what you want. I maybe would have liked Armageddon or something a little bit different, but Calamity is pretty strong. I'll go, I'm, I'm fine with that. With Calamity, you get to create a whole bunch of hazardous terrain and obstacles in a single rune and do damage while you're doing it. So you get to create three one hex hazardous terrain tiles in featureless hexes and three one hex obstacle tiles in empty hexes in the same room as you. There's no range, so it just has to be in the same room. There are some really big rooms in Frosthaven, so even in those, yes, you can create three hazardous terrain tiles and three obstacle tiles basically anywhere in the room, as long as they meet the requirements of featureless and empty. And then all enemies in that room suffer four damage. You basically just like rained meteoric fire or something like that in the entire room and all the enemies in there suffer four damage. And that's not all. If you have fire to burn and you have earth to burn, with fire, you burn fire, you get two more hazardous terrain tiles. So you're putting out five hazardous terrain tiles in this room that you potentially just entered and if you burn earth it's the same situation you get two more obstacle tiles to put out you can put out five hazardous terrain tiles and five obstacle tiles with this one action it is a burn you also cause damage to all the enemies in the room and you gain two experience that is a lot but it's a level nine card and it's a level nine card burn and this is just ideal for like the boss room of an encounter that you just entered right you can put this stuff all over the place. It's especially nice because with the hazardous terrain, they just have to be featureless, so you can put it right under enemies, right under the boss, maybe, potentially. So there's a lot of value that you can get out of this top action. It's a 35 initiative, which is okay. And the bottom is also really interesting, too. You get to take control of all the enemies in the same room as you. Again, there's no range here. They just have to be in the same room as you. You control all of them and make them do a move one. So if there's already hazardous terrain or other things in, in the room that they're avoiding and they're right next to, you go, hey, you're not going to walk into that hazardous terrain. And it's not a loss this bottom. So I think, again, we have an obvious choice in this case. If you're going with that tanky type of build, then you want the card on the left. You want the stone armor. If you're going to deal a whole bunch of damage and throw out hazardous terrain all over the place, you definitely go with Calamity. Very solid cards on both sides. Okay, with all the cards out of the way, let's start talking about your character sheet. And we'll start with Masteries. The first Mastery is pretty simple and straightforward. You just have to create an obstacle or a hazardous terrain tile every round. This is just the kind of Mastery that you have to plan for and know that you're going to do from the very beginning. It will, it will affect what cards you choose. You probably can't do this in the early levels. You probably need more of the different cards that allow you to create hazardous terrain and obstacles to make sure that you have one available every round but it's definitely a doable mastery. The second mastery is much more complicated. And honestly, this is usually what I find in the masteries. The first one is one that's doable within the confines of the class. You just have to plan it out and be ready for it. And the second one is often like a really difficult thing to pull off. 
In this case, you have to move enemies. Key point here is enemies. It doesn't have to be a single enemy. But you have to move enemies through six hazardous terrain tiles that you created in one turn. You're not going to be able to do this at level one for sure. You're going to have to be much much higher level to be able to accomplish this. And even then, it's going to be difficult. Everything needs to line up in just the right way. I think it's definitely something that you can accomplish, but you're really going to have to focus to get this second mastery. Okay, let's talk about perks. I really want to talk about that, that attack modifier deck. I think you get a fabulous attack modifier deck if you fully use all the perks for it with this class. But first, let's talk about the unique perks for the Meteor. First one, there's an ignore scenario effects. The one thing I don't like about this for the Meteor is it doesn't give you anything extra. Most of the other ignore scenario effects perks that you get give you something a little bit on the top. Like I think with the Banner Spear you get ignore scenario effects and then you get to ignore the minus ones on armors if I'm remembering correctly. But in any case, I know there's a class that does that and most of the time these ignore scenario effects perks have an additional incentive to take them. That is not the case with the Meteor. So you do have to decide, can I live with getting a curse at the beginning of a round every once in a while? Can I live with taking damage or doing the, having to deal with the other things that sometimes happen at the beginning of a scenario? Yes or no? I mean, I usually like taking ignore scenario effects, but I don't think you always have to take it. I want to skip down to the very bottom perk here, which this is one that, like in my short guide to the Meteor or Pyro class, I definitely recommended taking this and I would stick with that recommendation. It does cost you three check marks, but when you get this perk and activate it, then every time you go into a scenario, you and all your allies are immune to the effects of your hazardous terrain. That is super beneficial, especially for you, since you have a lot of attacks that benefit you if you're standing in hazardous terrain. So it's super helpful if you don't have to worry about the damage from it. It's also nice for your allies because then they can freely move through it. They also don't have to worry about enemies pushing them into your hazardous terrain. One of the key things here is this only impacts the hazardous terrain that you create. It does not count for hazardous terrain that's just out on the map for other reasons. That stuff is still bad for you and bad for your allies. One other additional benefit that you should realize about that is that your enemies avoid hazardous terrain at almost all costs, unless it's the only way they can actually land an attack on someone. That's the only time that will go into hazardous terrain. Otherwise, they're going around it all the time. So that often leaves tiles that you or your allies can use to get into good positions against your enemies. So a really strong perk to take. This is especially useful if you've opened up the Meteor later, later or you've retired a few characters. So you have those extra perks available and can just put them all into this immediately. That could be a solid choice to start out. The next unique perk I want to talk about, whenever you long rest, you may, adjust, you may destroy an adjacent obstacle to gain ward. So you declare long rest at the beginning of the turn. So if you end a turn where you're next to an obstacle, or you could even plan that you know you're going to long rest that next turn, find an obstacle, try to get next to it. So then when you do decide to long rest that turn, you can destroy that obstacle, give yourself ward. So then you can more easily long rest in areas that are maybe not as safe, right? Because at least you're cutting in half the first damage source that you might take while you're just sitting there resting. I wouldn't prioritize this particular one, but I could see prioritizing it if you did want to go that full tank build. This is definitely something that would benefit that build. This next unique perk is for whenever you short rest, you can burn fire to perform wound target one to an enemy either occupying or adjacent to hazardous terrain. Um, so I do like the effect that you can put a wound one on somebody. It also doesn't have a range on it. So hazardous terrain anywhere where there happens to be an enemy next to it, if you perform a short rest, which you get to do at the very beginning, you can dish out a wound potentially. But I don't love that you have to spend the fire for it. Fire often has better applications for you, in my opinion. So of these unique perks, I definitely recommend the ignore the hazardous terrain damage for you and your party and your allies. That includes summons too, remember? Um, and I probably would still take the ignore scenario effects. It's just nice to not have to worry about those extra irritating things that sometimes happen. Sometimes you get brittled at the start of a scenario. Sometimes you get cursed. There's all kinds of stuff. So I'd start with those two. Okay, now let's talk about those attack modifier deck perks. There's a lot of them. They're really good with this class. So just to kind of sum up, if you took all of your different attack modifier deck perks that are listed here, 
this is what your deck would look like. You'd only have you'd have the one miss. Obviously, you're always going to have that natural miss. You'd have the one. You'd also only have one minus one card. You wouldn't have any minus twos, just one minus one card. Everything else in your deck is a positive effect. Fully modded out, you have 11 different cards that add plus one to your attack, and you have three plus two cards in your deck. That's pretty solid. That's 14 cards that add additional damage to your attacks when you fully mod out the attack modifier deck for the Pyroclast. Now, that does cost you 13 perks to get there. <laughs> so it's not like just free, but it's definitely a way that can be really beneficial to you. As in most cases, do the things that remove the negatives first, get rid of that minus two, get rid of those minus ones. I think it costs you like five perks to get rid of your minus two and all but one of your minus ones. So that's a great start. You're already looking better. Your variance is gonna go way down if you don't have those minuses in your deck. I also really like one particular perk that removes minuses. That's the one where you remove a minus one card and replace it with a plus zero that also gets to generate hazardous terrain. So that's a double bonus card. You're removing a minus one, you're making it a plus zero, but then also being able to create hazardous terrain with it just through your attack modifier deck. Really, really solid perk. Through these perks, you can also get pushes, you can get wounds, you can get element generation. There's a lot of good stuff in these perks. So my overall recommendation, I would start with spending three perks on the one that makes you immune to your hazardous terrain damage for you and your party members. Start there. And after that, just start hammering your attack modifier deck. I think I would probably live with the scenario effects for a while and just keep working on the attack modifier deck. Maybe I'll slip in the ignore scenario effects thing after I've taken out all my negatives, remove the minus twos and the minus ones and replace the minus ones and stuff like that, and then go back to hammering the attack modifier deck perks. Some classes, they're not as good, but I think for this class, modifying that attack modifier deck is going to make you really strong. So really go after those. Last little thing here, I'm going to talk briefly about items. I don't like to get into a lot of detail on items for the different classes that I do guides for, just because I don't know which items you have available to you. I don't want to spoil things in that respect, even though we're spoiling a whole locked class here, but you knew that getting into it. I don't want to also additionally spoil some later item that might be available to you, but I can talk about what are some of the things you should look for. First of all, I do think that it can be helpful to have movement boots, at least early on with that Igneous Path card where you can then move further when you're generating that hazardous terrain. I do think it's not a terrible idea to take some shield cards with the Meteor. You are in melee range all the time, so you do often take damage with this class and you don't have a ton of hit points to start. So at least early on it might be a good idea to take a shield with you, or maybe if you can fit in armor somehow. The problem is you don't have the kind of perks that ignore the minus ones that you have to put in for that armor. So you really need to make you know smart choices there when you do do that. Overall though, all you really want to do is juice up your damage for the most part. Unless you're doing that tank thing, then maybe that's a little bit different. But if you're like me and you played the pyro class because you wanted to do a lot of damage and burn your enemies with fire, well then you want to juice up your damage. So potions can do that. Add damage to your attacks. Um, there are various items that can add damage to your attacks. Anything that's going to increase your damage output is often a good choice with the Pyroclast. So there you have it. That's my Pyroclast full length guide. I really, really like this class. I went from the Banner Spear, which I enjoyed the Banner Spear too. I have two different videos about the Banner Spear that you're free to watch if you like. But the Banner Spear took a little bit more time to get off the ground and a little more time for me to really enjoy the class. The first couple levels were a little bit of a slog with that class. That was not the case with the Pyro class. Now, to be fair, I had already retired a character, so I got, got extra perks to start, and I started at a higher level because we were at a higher prosperity level. But still, right away, this class was fun. Right away, I was dim dishing out serious damage. And it was refreshing after the complication of the Banner Spear in terms of formations to go to something that is still complicated, if you want to get the most out of it, as far as your placement of a hazardous terrain, how you can get the enemies into the hazardous terrain and all that jazz. But you can do an awful lot of damage with this class, and it's an awful lot of fun. You really can't go wrong. So, thanks for watching another video. Like, subscribe, do the things if you're interested in that. Thanks for watching, and you'll see more from me soon.